Welcome to the Serial Port. Today, we'll be restoring an Apple Macintosh Classic 2 in preparation for its introduction into the museum. The Macintosh Classic 2 began production in October of 1991 and was intended to be a faster and more upgradable version of the original Macintosh Classic. With its Motorola 6803 CPU, it was billed as being quite a bit faster than the 386 PC systems of the time. And Apple really believed in this system, as they had manufactured over 100,000 of them in time for its release in 91. They had reason to believe in it as well, because the original Classic was the fastest selling Macintosh at that time, so they believed they had a winning formula with the Classic series. The unveiling, though, was a bit, uh, let's say, anticlimactic. This Monday, when we uh, unveil it to the public in Comdex, and here's the big moment, folks. We'll talk more about the importance and impact of the system later on. But first, let's dive into this example here and get our restoration underway. The Serial Port Museum acquired the system in a rural part of North Carolina just south of the Virginia border. It had been in storage for decades, but was in decent shape for its age. The first power on, though, showed some issues. These systems are pretty notorious for issues like this, which can be symptomatic of failing capacitors on both the logic and analog boards. For those not familiar with the terms, the logic board is akin to a PC's motherboard. It contains the CPU, memory, and handles the input and output. The analog board in this case has the power supply and the supporting circuits for the CRT. So let's take a closer look at the physical condition of the system. It looks like all four screws are missing, so that means the case has definitely been opened before. After removing the rear cover, we can see that things are pretty grimy inside. Looking around the analog board, we can see that pretty much everything will need a good cleaning. There are some capacitors here that are bulging, which is a clear indicator that they need to be replaced. The system is missing the original hard drive, but it was supplied with the original 50-pin SCSI cable, so we'll need to address that later on. Just a word of warning, don't disconnect the high voltage anode like we're doing here unless it's been safely discharged first. Next, we can remove the neck board. And now we can remove the analog board. After that, we can easily slide the logic board out. Looking at the analog board, it's in overall decent condition inside the capacitors. Nothing appears to be damaged, so that bodes well for the restoration. The logic board has seen better days though. There's a relatively thick coating of grime and some metal corrosion here as well. It does have the original battery, but that's long been dead and discharged. With the boards out, we can get a closer look at the condition of the chassis. We've got a decent amount of rust on several sections that will need to be addressed. The fan is also looking a little rough, so let's go ahead and take that out. Next, let's go ahead and remove the floppy drive cradle.
and now we can remove the floppy drive itself. So we'll get started on the logic board first. Our first task is to remove any of the sensitive components like the SIM memory modules and ROM chips so we can ensure they aren't damaged. These are one megabyte SIM modules and there's already two megabytes of memory on the logic board. So our system has four megabytes of memory total. We're using a little bit of lubricant here just to make the extraction a little bit easier and safer. And with those removed, we'll start on the capacitor replacement now. So we'll be replacing all of the surface mount electrolytic capacitors as they have a finite lifespan and are either causing issues now or would be at some point in the future. So we use bismuth solder paste to help us remove the old caps. And then we remove all of the old solder, clean the pads and use leaded solder paste to solder the new caps in. And here are all the old caps that we replaced. The board is now ready to go through our ultrasonic cleaning process and that'll get rid of all the gunk and grime that's on the board. And just look at the incredible difference the ultrasonic cleaning made. The results were pretty fantastic and even most of the metal corrosion was removed as well. And with that, our logic board restoration should be complete and we can move on to the analog board. All of the capacitors were replaced on the analog board, but with the added step of removing the components that cannot be immersed in the ultrasonic cleaning liquid. We also removed the IO shield so that can have rust and corrosion removed. And here's the finished product, new caps and a very clean board. We also removed the rust from the shield and painted it to prevent any further damage in the future. Moving on, here are the disassembled parts from the keyboard, mouse, and floppy drive. So we thoroughly cleaned the keyboard and replaced all the electrolytic caps on the control board. Same for the mouse, and now it's good as new. The floppy drive actually seemed to work okay, but since we've got it out, it makes sense to go ahead and tear it down to inspect everything.
With everything clean and re-lubricated, it works really smoothly now. Last but not least, we can't forget about our system fan. We cleaned off all the dust and cleaned up the cabling and analog board guard as well. We need to remove the CRT from the front panel so that we can clean it and run the front panel plastic through a retrobrite process. This involves using hydrogen peroxide to remove the yellowing that occurs with plastic of this type. The yellowing is by no means severe, so hopefully that means the retrobrite will work really well. And you can see the contrast here between the yellowed areas and the intact area that's just under the raised portion. And we'll do this for all of the yellowed plastic in the system. So it's time for the reassembly. So we'll start with our system fan and that's going into the chassis that has had the rust removed and a fresh coat of paint applied. And now the floppy drive. Everything's looking really nice and fresh, so let's go ahead and get this installed in the front panel. Next, we'll put the paper guard on the back of the analog board using the original push pins. And now we can install the analog board into the chassis. The high voltage anode and neck board go on next. We'll connect up our fan to the analog board. And now it's time for the logic board. We'll first install our memory SIM modules. We'll install the ROMs that we had previously removed prior to the ultrasonic cleaning. Fresh new battery for the logic board. And once our floppy cable is installed, the logic board is ready to slide into place. We'll connect the other end to the floppy drive itself. And finally, install the interface cable between the logic and analog boards. And now we can finally install the rear cover. Be sure to subscribe to our channel to catch the next installment where we'll show the first power up after the restoration and leave us a comment below with suggestions on what software we should install. We'll also talk more about the system and its impact it had on the 90s, the ultimate decade for computing. Thanks for watching.